Welcome to Flashback, a podcast by the Okaloosa County Public Information Office. Get ready to dust the nostalgia off your sleeve as we talk with Okaloosa citizens who share with us how things used to be. I'm your host, Nick Tomacek. It's time to step into your imaginary DeLorean, tap your flux capacitor, and flash back. Have you ever seen a group of kids get told to get in a line? They all run to be first, sometimes shoving or squeezing their way to the top. Being first usually means winning, right? Well, I'd like to think we're winning here in Okaloosa County. We've had low property taxes even as prices for other things rise. We boast a diverse landscape for outdoor activities that encompass, you know, either a suntan at the beach or a hike or hunting adventures in the woods. All we're missing is an abundance of snow and mountains, and I'm a Kentucky boy and I sure do like mountains, but I don't miss digging my car out of an unplowed snowy roadway. Okaloosa County is also winning with a consistent pride in supporting our military service members at the largest Air Force base in the world, winning. And hey, what about the world's luckiest fishing village, right? And the largest commercial fishing fleet in the state. Pretty great stuff, right? But has Okaloosa County made it to the front of the line, being the first county to do something in this gigantic coastal state? Of course we have. Due to location only, we are in the first judicial circuit, the first congressional district, state senatorial district, and Florida Highway Patrol has their troopers serving Okaloosa County, which is in Troop A, and A is first, right? I mentioned our community-wide support of the military. It should come as no surprise that Okaloosa County was the first county in the state to become a Purple Heart County. After all, Okaloosa County has the most highly decorated members of the military, active or retired, living in this beautiful area and has well over 3,000 Purple Heart recipients. Of course, we should have been the first Purple Heart County. If you don't already know, the Purple Heart history began uh, going back to the Revolutionary War, it was an award originally designed for the common soldier. Conditions for a soldier in the late 1700s were deplorable, to say the least. Lack of food, no boots, disease, constant marching, cold. And so mutiny wasn't uncommon, and though General George Washington was known to be pretty hard and strict, he recognized, well, how crappy things could be for a soldier. He began awarding the badge of merit to soldiers during the Revolutionary War uh, to these heroes to recognize their sacrifice and to help boost morale within the ranks. The first recipient was said to be Sergeant Eliza Churchill from the 4th Troop 2nd Regiment of Light Dragoons, which had conducted some of the most daring and spectacular raids of the Revolutionary War. Sergeant Churchill received that badge of merit in recognition of his leadership in two commando-style raids. This award evolved into today's award, the Purple Heart. To receive a Purple Heart these days, according to the United States Army Human Resources Command, it's awarded to members of the Armed Forces of the United States who, while serving under component authority in any capacity with one of the U.S. Armed Services after April 5, 1917, has been wounded, was killed, or who has died, or may hereafter die of wounds received in any action against an enemy of the United States. It also includes friendly fire incidents and if service members were wounded or killed while helping out a partner country in an armed conflict. The local chapter of the Military Order of the Purple Heart, number 811, began honoring Purple Heart individuals with a commemoration wall at the Air Armament Museum in 2001 following the attacks on September 11th and the subsequent war in Afghanistan and additional war in Iraq. But it wasn't until 2012 that we officially became a Purple Heart designated county. And it was the work of the county commission, mainly Commissioner Bill Roberts, and the Purple Heart Region 4 Commander Bill Everett to get this approved. This is William Bill Everett, Military Order of the Purple Heart Region 4 Commander. He stood with Commissioner Bill Roberts, members of the state delegation from the Order of the Purple Heart, and Everett's wife. Gold Star and Blue Star mothers were also present during the meeting. For that award, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Commissioner Roberts. I'm going to ask Bill Everett to, to come up to the podium with me. We, uh, we did a lot of research. We can't do the 
this river. Had a lot of conversations uh, about this proclamation, and we just wanted to make sure we got it right because it's so important to us. We added the amendment to to the motion there, talking about the signage that's going to be in Oakland County, not only stating uh, us as the first county as far as the military order of Purple Hearts, but it also shows that we have two metal monitors from Oakland County. So, if you would, I need to cast a question about to introduce and, and bring up before you leave the proclamation, Mr. Chair. I think Oakland County, Walton County. All our neighboring counties deserve to be the first order of Purple Hearts in the state of Florida because it's so much about the military, the mission here, uh, the folks who have served, the cousins who retire here, and those who are serving now. And uh, it's just not as good as possible. Whereas the Purple Heart is the oldest declaration. Commissioner Roberts read the proclamation. Now, therefore, we proclaim the open support of county commissioners here by the player. Oakland County as the first Purple Heart County in the state of Florida. We will adopt this day, March 6, 2012, and is signed by our Chairman Don Emmons and by Don Power of Purple Court. We're certainly glad to be here this morning. A photo was taken with the Military Order of the Purple Heart and the Gold Star and Blue Star Mothers, and then the local chapter 811 commander, Sam Houston, said a few words. Uh, thank you very much. Um, First and foremost, I would like to uh, thank the Region 4 Commander, Mr. Everett, his lovely wife, Jackie, and of course we have uh, Commander Sanchez and his wife, uh, Gloria, from the state on all the work that they have done to make Florida the top state in all of the country when it comes to Purple Heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really enjoy it. Uh, just one quick statement that I would like to make. This proclamation will serve as a legacy for everyone in this room and for all veterans and, of course, the Blue and Gold Star Moms. We will, you will, be, we will be permanently enshrined as folks drive up and down our roads. They will see that sign and they will know the dedicated service, not only of our military, but of our entire community and what it means to us. And with that in mind, as Commander uh, Eric mentioned, we would like to welcome each and every commander, uh, each and every commissioner, <laughs> into the uh, military order of the Purple Arms. The video shows Houston handing out honorary Purple Heart memberships to each commissioner on the dais that day. Our chapter, the Chapter 811 of the Military Order of the Purple Hearts, is named in honor of Army Sergeant Timothy Paget, who was killed in action in Afghanistan on May 8, 2007. He's a Walton County native and was a member of the 7th Special Forces Group Airborne. The chapter's territory also includes Walton County. Our Purple Heart chapter here was also the first chapter in the nation to have a female wounded veteran as a commander. Crestview was the first Purple Heart city in Okaloosa County, and you will see signs along our highways denoting and recognizing Okaloosa as the first Purple Heart County in the state. And it's not just a sign or just another county proclamation. It's a community-wide recognition of the people who gave their lives or were wounded in combat defending American freedom. You can learn more about the Military Order of the Purple Heart at purpleheart.org. Our next first is another special moment in Okaloosa County history and probably in the world. For decades, people didn't know how to properly care for people with intellectual disabilities. Many times in our country's history, they were institutionalized without the opportunity to live a, quote, regular life and be included in all of the things most people enjoy, and not just included, to at least have the opportunity to be included is important to understand. And that means sports, too. Special Olympics has given countless people with intellectual disabilities that opportunity and inclusion. Okaloosa was one of those places in the early days that led that charge. The first county in the state to be a Special Olympics county, Okaloosa County. Here's Damian McNeil, who's the regional director for the Northwest Region of Special Olympics. 
And and so so what do you know about uh, Okaloosa County in particular in in relation to Special Olympics? How did it become? I, I'm told it was the first county to become a Special Olympics county. How does how does that work, and, and how did that happen? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Dr. Charlie McFarlane, he was the principal at um, Silver Sand Schools from the six at least the '60s until uh, I believe like the '80s or '90s. Um, and Dr. McFarlane uh, was, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, I would say. Uh, very forward um, thinking in terms of, you know, getting people who have disabilities uh, into more mainstream activities. And so he, um, you know, it was really, really important to him to bring something to the program. And he was, you know, always researching and just kind of doing stuff. So Dr. McFarland um, in, I believe it was 1967, uh, he saw in the newspaper uh, that the um, Kennedy Shrivers up in Chicago, where uh, they were doing a thing, and they called it Special Olympics. Um, and so there was one program in Chicago, the very first one, uh, founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And then there was another uh, uh, program, I believe, somewhere else in Illinois. And Dr. McFarland saw it in the newspaper and said, well, hey, you know, I want to do that at my school. I've got, you know, several uh, dozen or maybe 100 students here, all ESC students. And um, this is 1967-ish. And he um, reached out to them, I think, by mail um, and said, I want to do what you're doing. Can you kind of send me a curriculum and what equipment do I purchase and how do I do it? And they kind of they sent him like a, a kit almost on how to start Special Olympics. And so he started it at Silver Sand School in Okaloosa County. Um, And that was the very first program in the state of Florida. And I believe it's the third program um, worldwide. So there was Chicago, one other one in Illinois uh, at the time of him reaching out, and then uh, Okaloosa County at Silver Sands. Wow. I had no idea. The original number of Special Olympics athletes in Okaloosa during that early time was 12. In fact, there is still one person from that era still competing. Her name is Ann James. She's a swimmer. We'll hear from Damien about her in a moment, but let's first talk about numbers and growth from that original 12 to what we have today. Yeah, so for my region, um, participants in total, we have about 4,500 uh, participants. Um, within the Northwest region, so the 22 counties across the uh, panhandle, um, about 4,500 participants. That includes school programming, so maybe they don't have a medical on file with us, but they are participating in some Special Olympics activities. Uh, Regional competition, if they get first place there, they advance to state competition. We have USA Games, right, so our national competition, USA Games every four years. State Games are every single year. USA Games are every four years. and so uh, I think it's in Minnesota in four years. We just had it. We just hosted it in the state of Florida this year um, for the very first time, which was really, really cool, down in Orlando. Okay. Um, and then four years ago, we, uh, we sent a bunch of athletes from across the state, including from Okaloosa County, to Seattle uh, to compete there. Um, and then the year after our USA Games, we sent athletes to World Games. Um, i trying to think where it was. I think four years ago it was Abu Dhabi. Uh, we sent wow. some athletes from the uh, yeah from the state of Florida to Abu Dhabi um, for equestrian. I think that was kind of a big one. That we oh sent yeah, for. okay. Yeah, um, and then uh, this year we are sending. We don't have anybody from my region, unfortunately, uh, that I that I um, have heard about. But um, we are sending. I think it's. I, I don't know. We're sending maybe a, half a dozen or a dozen athletes to um, uh, Germany next year um, from Florida. Uh, for world games so it's a big deal you know it's it's been we have an athlete here in okaloosa county who has been participating for over 50 years continuously um with uh she's still participating in swimming she started swimming in 1968 i believe um with dr mcfarland when she was in middle school um i think she was 11 um something maybe it was 69 uh but either way she was like 11 years old or something like that when she started with dr mcfarland 
and she's still participating with us. I took her to uh, a swimming state competition uh, just pre-COVID, so 2019, and um, she double golded there, right, in her 60s. Um, she got a double, double gold medal down at her state competition in Sebastian, you know, so central kind of South Florida okay. area. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, that's without Special Olympics, right? She's been participating continuously for over 50 years. Um, without Special Olympics, you know, there are just so there there are a lot of um, things that uh, you know, or there's a lot of quality of life, I guess I would say, experiences that they wouldn't have had, right? Um, yeah. People with with intellectual and developmental disabilities, just you know, it's her life. Like Special Olympics is her life. She will tell you, um, you know, I asked her how long she plans on participating in Special Olympics, and she said, till she can't walk anymore, you know, huh. till the wheels fall off, right? <laughs> wow. Basically, what she told me. The early beginnings with Dr. McFarland led to the official founding of Special Olympics Florida in 1972 as an organization. They're in fact celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. Our next first takes us to the water. I know we have the best beaches in the world. You know we have the best beaches in the world. The millions of people who visit our area each year seem to think so too. But let's take an imaginary boat ride into the Gulf of Mexico away from the beach for a moment. We're going fishing. We're going to go after marlin or giant tuna. We slip the boat into gear and head out to deeper water. We get out about 80 miles or more and set our lines. Yes, 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 yes. That kind of excitement is something that folks in the Coastal Resource Team with Destin for Walton Beach Tourism here in Okaloosa County are trying to duplicate for anglers, along with a marine biology data twist. Here's Coastal Resource Manager Alex Fogg from a recent interview he did for an upcoming docu-story about coastal resource sustainability, talking about this Okaloosa first. One of the projects that we've done here in Destin, Fort Walton Beach that no one else has ever done in the state of Florida or the country itself is uh, install or, or deploy FADs, fish aggregating devices, which are essentially buoys that are deployed out in thousands of feet of water. They're about 60 to 80, feet, 60 to 80 miles from Destin, Fort Walton Beach. And the purpose is to provide a location for folks to go and um, target some of those pelagic species of fish that are a little bit harder to target here. Um, those can be your marlins, your tunas, mahi-mahi, wahoo. The list really Really does go on uh, but also provides a, a really awesome location for research um, each of these fad buoys actually has an acoustic data logger on it that can track fish movement um, so if a fish swims by that has one of these unique tags it detects it and we work with a number of different universities and organizations throughout the United States uh, to provide them with the data and, and work on understanding the movement of these different species there are eight of these fads in the Gulf of Mexico Two came loose in January 22 due to wind and weather, and they were recently redeployed. Since being deployed in 2020, the network of fads that we have here has exceeded expectations. It's brought fishermen from Mexico Beach, east of here, all the way over from Venice, Louisiana. And just this past spring, a dozen blue marlin were caught on one of the fads, according to Alex. Since 1915, Okaloosa County has been on the map, and for over 100 years, this county has worked to be the best. Or should I say, the people of Okaloosa County have strived to make it the best. To all of you who agree we should continue to try and make more firsts, I say, Yes! 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 This episode was produced by me. Our executive producer is April Sarver, who is the public information officer for the county. Special thanks to Damian McNeil with Special Olympics and to Alex Fogg. Thanks also to all of our friends in uniform who currently serve or who have served our country and to those who were wounded or killed in combat wearing that purple heart. Thanks to the fishing crew aboard the vessel No Name out of Destin for the use of the audio from a recent tuna catch. Our theme music is composed by Jason Shaw on audionautics.com. Thanks for listening. I'll see you around town.